This portrait is my kitchen table, King Lear, and the pinnacle of my achievement in the role so far. The reason being that I fell ill and didn't get past the second rehearsal. But months before my first rehearsal in Wellington, July the 1st, 2007, the New Zealand management who had invited me to do the role emailed and requested a photograph of me as the king. A tall order to be photographed in a role I had only practised alone as I learned the lines under a tree in our London garden or at the aforementioned kitchen table. But fate stepped in, or rather my hand slipped, and the webcam, the tiny lens in the lid of my Apple laptop, sprang into action and a programme that suggested etching seemed to simulate rain. So they got Lear and the storm, without a thunder sheet shaken or a fork of stage lightning flashed, only an ankle poise lamp and an electric fan to blow my hair, I didn't even have to stand up, and there was nobody else there in the kitchen with me, not even the fool. As my image knocked up in a few minutes, was attached to an email and sent to the other side of the world through cyberspace, I was momentarily linked with the age of candles and oil footlights, the period of 150 years before the fool was reinstated by the actor Macready in 1838, impossible now to think of Lear starting off in the storm alone. But that's how it had been all that time since the reopening of the theatres by Charles II, and how it was with me at the kitchen table. I couldn't but think about the fool, of course, despite my solo storm performance for the Webb Kang. In fact, I had drawn a double portrait playing both parts. And at a pottery class I joined, depicted the two of them together in the storm, in clay. Carrying these clay trophies home from the kiln, I was speaking the lines of the storm scene out loud, since there was plenty of traffic noise to compete with in the Finchley Road, and few pedestrians to hear me, when I happened to look in a furniture shop window, normally dedicated to the modern, and saw a framed original engraving of Garrick as, as, as Lear in the storm. You'd have thought my Lear was meant to be. Lear does ask to be alone before he takes shelter in the hovel. He prays. Macready in his diary boasts of directing some of those lines of this strange prayer at Queen Victoria in the royal box. A terrible misjudgment. The only monarch he is criticising in this speech is himself. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er ye are, but bide the pelting of this pitiless storm. How shall your houseless heads, your unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness defend you from seasons such as this? Oh, I have ta'en too little care of this. Take physic, pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. I'm going to attempt to improvise and not to pontificate about King Lear. I've moved away, a long way away from my kitchen table. Um, the domestic scene. Is the family kitchen table the best place uh, to study this domestic tragedy? Um, I found it very hard to speak domestically around my own kitchen table. I might find it better here in a hotel in Budapest. 
But <laughs> round the kitchen table, my own kitchen table, where so much love and nurture and happiness and parties and jokes and the odd savage row, of course, um, all grew and um, How do you get yourself, amongst those situations, into the state of mind where you can actually believe you're going to kneel down in front of your daughter and say, Here, nature. Here, dear goddess. Here. Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility and never spring a babe to honour her. If she, you see, one is uh, going to start playing the demon of discontent if one isn't careful. Here, nature. Here, dear goddess. Here. Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility, and never spring a babe to honour her. If she must teem, let it be a child of spleen, and be a thwart, disnatured torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles on her brow of youth, with cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. In other words, let her feel like I feeling. Uh, family hate seems to be the strongest brand. But Lear has brought it on himself. He's, uh, critics tell you you've got to be an oak to play him, but um, oaks are strong. He's powerful, Lear, but he's not strong. What kind of father would say? Which of you, shall we say, doth love us? most, that we our largest bounty may extend, when nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first, and now. Uh, and so he goes on until he gets to the rigged, favoured choice of the one he loves most, Cordelia, who won't play the game. What can you say? to gain a third more ample than your sister's. Speak. Nothing. 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 Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Um, and so that famous scene goes on, and um, he banishes her uh, without a penny, <laughs> without a bit of the lamb that he promised. But his daughters are too damaged. They're all too damaged. Uh, there, there are daughters and sons who survive the kind of damage done by a dysfunctional father, and an absent mother in this case, and um, Cordelia is one of them. A and how does he survive? He's punished by nature that he prayed to in the storm and reduced by it, outcast himself. Uh, but he is the original <laughs> dog, old dog, that learns new tricks. The trick of uh, humility and uh, love, but also humility uh, that goes along with repentance.